Welcome everyone to a new episode of Genuine Rockstars and today's Genuine Rockstar is Anna Kral. Thank you so much for joining us, Anna. Hi, thank you. Could you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? I study geology and paleontology first and then I had a break in between and continued with my PhD in paleontology and in the end I became a doctor of biology. And now I'm research voluntary in a collection in Tübing, in the paleontological collection in Tübing, and doing more collection-based work, but um, I'm also trying to get some research published as well. You are a paleontologist with a specialization in secondary marine reptiles. What got you interested in paleontology in the first place and how did you end up studying plesiosaurs? Seeing so many people on social media always selling like they've been always dinosaur fans and they always knew they wanted to do that. I was a dinosaur nerd kid as well, but I actually wanted to do something like biology and chemistry or biochemistry and I was always interested in those weird intersection subjects like always something in between two big things so um that's the reason why i studied geosciences we went on an excursion to southern germany to switzerland and to northern italy and we went into all of those amazing museums and they had amazing fish fossils and amazing marine reptiles and the difference to dinosaurs is always that they are so complete and they look so perfectly preserved. And I was so, so blown away by that, that you could walk past them. And usually someone will tell you, well, someone has to describe the specimen and we don't know anything about it. Or that, especially in marine reptiles, like very few things go beyond this is taxon XY <laughs> and it's related to this and usually most of the things that are done on marine reptiles are very like the basic science it's it's this taxon because of the characters you see there and that's it like no one really goes beyond that and asks questions like in dinosaur sciences to me like yeah like how, how did it move how did it eat what did it how yeah. did they live like the like the real questions to me like it was an animal how did it live what did it do the whole day i i, I don't expect our audience to be fully familiar with plesiosaurs um personally i always have to think of the loch ness monster because i still feel that the loch ness monster i mean it's a plesiosaur I think I've actually heard that at some point in history, they started to to make them more plesiosaur-like, that earlier on they were more snake-like. A part that I like really a lot about sauropterygians, and that's something that many people don't know because like the whole group went completely extinct. Within sauropterygia, there are groups that are called evolutionary experimental groups. After the Pomo Triassic extinctions, the seas were completely empty. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, sauropterygians and other marine animals exploded with various life forms within, I think, about 15 million years. And then they started to slowly dwindle and die out. And then we have a big problem. We have a gap in the fossil record and we have like 30 million years where we have basically no localities that give us marine sediments. So we don't know what's happening. And then suddenly we have the first plesiosaur. What makes sauropterygians sauropterygians is that's something that's, that I find so cool about nothosaurs is that they elongated their skulls like crocodiles. But the difference to, to crocodiles and all other animals with this elongated snout is that they elongated everything behind their eyes which is extremely unique and extremely strange to to elongate not the nose but like everything behind you it's so strange that they elongated all this back part and that the nose part is actually just 
normal, which is a strange thing, and that's also what <laughs> that one has. <laughs> when we are within the plesiosaurus, there is always this kind of shape that you will find again. You find either the small head, the long neck, or the short neck and the large skull with the large teeth. And that's um, like shapes that always evolve over and over again within plesiosaurs and no one really knows why. And then like typically plesiosaur is that everything like behind the neck is always quite uniform. Like they always have a teardrop shaped body, a shortened tail, they don't have a long crocodile like swimming tail anymore. And they have these weird four flippers that look very similar to sea turtle four flippers, for example. And now we are all stuck there without any animal that's just anywhere close to comparison. And we try to figure out how these weirdos swam through the oceans. <laughs> and you're trying to find out because you recently published on muscle strength and function in plesiosaur limbs. Could you tell us what you studied and what you've discovered? We started off with uh, trying to reconstruct the muscles, actually, for these animals. And um, we did so by looking at recent reptiles, at um, like rather lizard-like um, animals, at turtles and um, at recent crocodiles. And the idea is that they are rather vastly related to sort origins, but if you find like a certain muscle, for example, in like the large breast muscle, which is something that we also have, um, if you find this in all three of those recent animals, you can pretty surely say that this also existed in the extinct animal. That's actually uh, what I was doing for every limb muscle of the forelimb and every limb muscle of the hind limb and that added to like around 50 muscles in total so for four different animals where does the muscle start where does the muscle stop muscles always have at least two points of attachment and one where it derives from it's called the origin and the other one the insertion so that's the basic pattern, but muscles can also be extremely more differentiated. Like you can have two muscular heads, which is in our biceps or triceps, for example, the case that you can actually have two muscle bellies that are used for different things. Why is it still considered controversial whether plesiosaurs uh, like flew underwater or rode? Like people looked at those at those flippers and some people thought they look like rowing devices but um, rowing devices are rather like duck feet for example or otter feet and they would end rather bluntly and also they can spread their fingers like to to spread this web and to me these look like wings i mean that's also a reconstruction and someone thought they have to look like wings but also if you look at rather complete plesiosaur fossils which are there you see they rather have this wing-like shape and they don't end this bluntly and that's also what penguins and sea turtles have and they fly underwater like flying implies they use lift but the difference between using drag and using lift is probably depending on the environment and also on the energy uptake it takes. So um, like ducks and pond turtles, they live in complex habitats, I would say. Like they have to, to move around um, algae, they have to move around little roots and they, they have to maneuver a lot. And then it makes sense to use the rather energy intensive way of swimming because they have to, to swim around things to get to, to their food. But sea turtles run into the ocean and then they drift with the large sea currents around the oceans and they travel rather slowly, but over vast areas. Like if, if you really look at the bones and if you really look at the joint structures, you see rather more similarities to sea turtles, for example, or in some way also to penguins as well. 
then to like rowing turtles, for example, like the shoulder joint of a sea turtle, of a recent sea turtle. It looks so obviously similar to plesiosaur shoulder girdles. And it's so, it's like this oval and sea turtles don't have a ball and socket joint. And the ball and socket joint is what we have in our arm. So we can rotate our arm, we can lift it, we can put it down, we can move forward and backwards. And you, you would actually expect a ball, and, a ball and socket joint for rowing. Exactly. Like you have to turn your arm around and then push against the water. Exactly. Like it's 90 degrees turning around and that's a rotation in your upper arm. And that's something that I can absolutely not see happening in plesiosaurs. And you would know, because for this study, you reconstructed the flippers of plesiosaurs. I saw some pictures. It looks like you... You, you built a plesiosaur in your office and then attached strings for the muscles. Can you walk us through these experiments? The plesiosaur in the museum in, in Bonn was taken apart into pieces. Technician was taking molds of that and wanted to rebuild the whole skeleton. While he was doing that, he was taking test casts and um, he was testing with various materials and he had some he wanted to throw away. and. My supervisor, he said, well, if you want to throw them away, can you give them to me? Because I have an idea. So we started to build all those muscles onto that plesiosaur cast. And we actually put it on a frame and tried to, to mount it on like some wooden structure. And we get, also gave it a vertebral column in the back and tried to attach all those muscles. So in the end, we had a life-sized <laughs> cryptoclido skeleton in my office on my desk <laughs> which advice would you have for our viewers who are also interested in pursuing a research career in paleontology apart from having a very big office <laughs> <laughs> it's quite easy at least in germany to to just go out and find things <laughs> and i think that's that's the nice thing about paleontology. You don't have to go the academic way. A lot of people actually don't. And a lot of people are like the enthusiasts and the fossil collectors. And you can still contribute a lot to that. I know you're a mom, so I know that there's not many hours. But how do you like to spend the hours during which you're not studying ple plesiosaurs or sleeping? The most of my time I spend actually on, on playgrounds <laughs> right now. <laughs> love knitting and crochet and things like that. And um, I actually brought that downstairs as well. And I do weird things like wow. this. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Anna. You're a genuine rock star. Thank you very much.